Exactly. Good evening. I want to call to order the Planning Commission regular meeting for May 18, 2023. I will ask the city clerk to call roll, please. Anderson? Here. Badges? Here. Broker? Here. Gardner? Here. Bond? Here. Luce? Here. Here. Moving on to item two. Everyone has to be in front of them the agenda. Do I have a motion? Oh, well, first I should ask, is there any changes that anyone would like to see to the agenda? Any additions or changes? See none. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Reports. Not moved. Mache. All in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? Agenda is approved. Moving to item three, the approval of minutes. Uh, before everyone had a chance to review them. One thing I did want to mention, and I want to thank you, Sarah. I think you actually typed these up, the minutes, or you or Jamie. Okay. Excellent job. I think the, I noticed the minutes for the task force this week, the minutes that were in here, how thorough they are. It really allows anybody, to, you know, for each of us, but anybody in the community to kind of read through if they don't want to watch the whole Zoom on YouTube. Uh, so I just want to compliment you. I really, I, I appreciate it very much. Support. So with that, does anyone have any changes um, or additions to the minutes as they've been written? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes from April 20th, 2023 as presented. Second. second. Motion by Gardner, second by Anderson. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? Carries. Minutes are approved. Now we will move on to item four on the agenda. This is the public comment section. Now this is public comments on the agenda items only. If you would like to speak, you can come up to the microphone, state your name and address, and you can speak on any of the items that are on the agenda as old or new business. There is nobody online. I don't see anyone coming to the microphone in the room. So that will close public comments number one on agenda items. Next, we move on to old business. First item on any old business is the 245 Spear Street special land use request for a rented accessory drawing unit and site plan review. Uh, just to kind of remind everyone, you know, that's here in the room or anyone with, uh, online, we did have a public hearing on this at our April 18th planning commission meeting. Uh, at the public hearing, we heard from the applicant. We also had uh, two uh, comments, both supporting the ADU. We had none opposing. So the public hearing was closed. We began our del 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 deliberation. We determined that we needed more information, um, or at least requested it. And so it was tabled to today's meeting. Um, so in advance, um, I would like to uh, just indicate that I am one of the co-applicants and I will recuse myself from the conversation this evening for this item. Perfect. Let's move into it. Thank you. And so with that, Ryan, do we need to resummarize where we were or just bring the applicant up and ask him for the additional information? Because we're in the deliberation part, so we're not really in the hearing part. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I can provide, you know, kind of a, a, a brief update and then uh, I think the applicants here this evening to kind of present the additional information that the planning commission was looking for. As you recall, uh, there was some question about what the size was of the uh, principal dwelling uh, as far as its gross floor area uh, to determine um, the, the size that was going to be allowable for the accessory dwelling unit. Um, uh, kind of some uh, further planning as far as if uh, the, the size of the accessory dwelling needed to be reduced, how that, that space was going to be reduced or separated. Um, and then there was some question about uh, the parking area and the applicant has submitted additional materials in your packet for um, review and I believe they're uh, prepared to, to speak to that this evening for you. Jennifer Reese, 245 Spear Street. Welcome, Hello. Jen. Hi. Hi. Um, so where we last left off, we uh, had some open areas and in the three pages I submitted to this, I think I've answered them sufficiently. I'd be happy to either walk you through it or 
this take any questions? Yeah, it's too bad. I do have some questions. Hold on. I could ask a question. So the, um, Mr. Chair, if I may. Please. Um, I, I read what you submitted and maybe I'm missing it, but one of the issues in yeah, our, our planning zoning director just raised but was the issue about parking. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see it in your three pages addressed. So when I reviewed the consultant report that went to you, they actually noted that parking was not an issue and they passed on it. I don't think it's my interpretation of the report and what this ordinance says is that parking is not contingent upon it. So I didn't provide space, but there's plenty of parking. Um, it is a single width driveway. Mm -hmm. So if you park your cars in that driveway or car, mm -hmm. could you explain to me how somebody who rents your unit behind you could get in and out of the driveway either either they're going to block you in or you're going to block them in or they're going to park on the street and add to the uh, uh, on-street parking problem that the entire city has. So I don't necessarily agree with that. So we own two cars and we've lived here for many, many summers for this. We actually never have a parking issue. We can fit four cars in our driveway, as you said, nose to tail, straight through without blocking the sideway. What we do, and if we were to rent this, is we would park on the street. And we also have access to our neighbors across the street for their driveway as well, that we commonly use. So if you're going to rent, if you rent this to Joe Blow, Anyone. complete stranger, yep. Yep. Um, and they want to park in your driveway, you will park your two cars in the street or across the street in your neighbor's driveway? Before I answer that, can I actually ask Ryan if this is, is the approval for what we asked for, is the, the parking issue contingent on it? I'm happy to answer Commissioner Lachey's questions. I just want to make sure if it's, if this is germane. That's up, Mr. Chair. If you're... So I think the only reason he's asking is that we do require two off-street parking for any um, short-term rental or ADU okay. that would be potentially rented. So we need to have assurances that we have at least two spaces off, you know, on property as opposed to on the street. And, okay. and that's in your neighborhood. There's four spaces on property that uh, even our normal American cars would fit. What we often do, even during the summer, is that we are we're able on Spear Street where we are to find parking. It, it's not an issue for us. Of course, it does get very crowded on parade days. It does become an issue. We will give allowance if people rent, they will be able to park in our drive. And we will have two cars that we will be able to park on the street. I do not think that it would add to the um to the uh, idea and the impression that there is a parking issue on Spear Street or Francis or Mary or uh, Butler. I, I just want to add, just and this is partially for my clarification too, and Ryan, maybe you can help with this. The only parking requirement that we are looking at, as I understand it, is on page 14 of the memo, a lot with an accessory dwelling unit shall provide one additional parking space on a fully improved surface of concrete, asphalt, or brick, gravel, stone, or other surface, surface approved by the city. And then the comment from Ryan was sufficient parking exists on the driveway, which can accommodate at least four vehicles. So I, I, I think it's a great question. We should be thinking about it. I just want to make sure I'm on the same page, not just for this, but I, for other right. accessory dwelling units. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, so. Like that's Principal what I was thinking of, by the way, just, I'm sorry, before Ryan. Okay, this exactly is what you're looking at. Okay. I'm thinking of. So yeah, the principal dwelling has to have two parking or uh, space for two cars. Um, as you read, the accessory dwelling unit is required to have one. Uh, you know, there's some some guidance as far as where that that parking has to be, but I think it's within the planning commission's purview to to evaluate the site plan and, and the requirements to make sure that that standard is met and how you believe it's best met, perhaps. Right, and I think that the comment has been made that. It does provide for four parking spaces, so I think we, we may be able to assume that that is enough to accommodate the two plus one. Yeah. Which is what, you know, um, 
Brian you know, has, has noted as the administrator. Um, since it's been raised, we are not bound by your opinions as stated in nope. correct. these reports, correct? Correct. In fact, you should make your own determinations ultimately. That's exactly why we're here, correct? Correct. correct. Thank you. I very much agree with you, Mr. Lachey. But yes, I think it's 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 the guidance and kind of looking at and making certain that we all each understand, you know, what it is that we are to review. And then it's for our determination, you know, has it been met? And all Ryan has given is his opinion that that based on that one, he would say, you know, that that's probably been met. But it is our our privy. So, so that's also helpful for me to say. And so I say four cars can easily fit in our gravel driveway. Perfect. Okay. Who else has questions? I just went before I have. Well, um, I'll raise it. I'll question. raise it. Just go ahead. I was just. If, before, if it was going to go nowhere. I was, I was going to say, because I think the, the one thing that we were kind of asking for additional information on besides kind of just a confirmation, you know, on the parking, you know, was the actual size of the home. And so you have provided mm -hmm. the square footage of the home. So given the square footage of the home, it's been concluded that the 600 square feet maximum would be the larger or the lesser of those two numbers. So we're working with the 600. And I know that you have kind of created a drawing you know, this talks about the the total ADU being 768 square feet um, underneath one definition, you know, of the gross uh, floor, floor area. And then you've kind of created a drawing for us that identifies less than the 768 square feet by saying that the living area is 533.6 and the studio area being 115, giving you a total of 648. Yep. Plus square feet. Um, was this something that you guys created? Um, you mean the schematic that I had? or the yep. calculation? So, so after this, uh, after our last meeting, we measured the home and came up with the number that we had. And then we measured the ADU actually several times based on the recommendation that's in the, the consultant's report with some guidance from Ryan. It's corner to corner, including everything in this space except for the mechanical room. So this includes kitchen island, kitchen counters, laundry room, shower pans, Bathroom sink, this is corner to corner, the 533.6. And I'm calling it the living area, but it's the south portion that has the one bedroom kitchen and the front area or living area. So because the 768 was just taking the outside dimensions. 24 by 32. 24 by 32, correct. correct. So we've kind of concluded that the living area if we use the definition of interior living space. I use the definition is, that was in the consultant's right. pro for gross living area, all livable spaces, eating, cooking, living, right. basically. So we basically, we, and kind of whether we use that um, gross, the original one or the revised one, if we were taking the studio area out, we're yep. still below the 600 or, you know, I think it's either, calculation almost um so i think you know that that's helpful you know from my standpoint i'm questioning the lock off so the what lock? Uh, how do you how are you planning to to you know, keep the lock off separate from the adu i guess so that not the lock off but yeah i'm not an, i'm not an architect so that little orange space would be where the locked door would be and there's actually a door there already. So that that orange space was is what we're saying again from the consultant report for you. What we're asking to make a decision on is to have a locked door there that would not only denote the space, but clearly if we are able to rent the back area, they would not have access to the front studio area. And I'm I may be looking at the old application. It was for two bedroom originally. Has that been modified to one? I did not submit a new application. No. It would be, sorry, Ryan. No. 
It would be what? I'm sorry, you didn't understand. A web bedroom. Thank you. Just didn't. Sorry, I didn't mean the answer for you. No, no, you're, you're fine. Um, I had a question on the square footage of your house, and it's not a huge difference, but um, when I looked it up online, I found 2228 versus 2507. Did you measure the house or did you pull what, where did you get the square footage for your house? I don't, it doesn't affect the math for the ADU, but I was just curious. Where did you get the 2208? From online Allegan County property owner um, for your parcel number. So just, through our property pin? Through, I just went to the Allegan County website and look, is it BSNA or? Yeah, there's like an online uh, portal that are assessing information kind of connects to an online platform that folks can look up certain data about certain parcels. That, yeah, I, I brought an extra copy just so you guys can have it again. I mean, it doesn't affect this, but it. I just wanted to flag that the numbers don't jive. It, okay. It's a good question, Holly, because I, I don't want to get ahead to the other ADU, but I actually did the same thing for the other ADU because mm -hmm. I was just out of curiosity almost more than right. anything. Right. And they were different numbers too. So yeah. Yeah. The, similar, obviously not. Right. Way off. If, if I could posit something, it might be, do they have a definition on what they measure as square, as gross livable area? Yeah. And that, that's the thing, you know, it, it's dependent on like an assessor's measurements. Um, it may differ from like maybe gross floor areas defined in our zoning ordinance or something along those lines. There might be some difference there. I mean, again, it doesn't affect the math in terms of 600 square feet, but just wanted to flag it for you. And I left it just so you have it because it's handy to have. I didn't even know that existed. And I mean, if it would make people, I can tell you what we measured, if that would make you feel comfortable on the 2,500 square feet. Again, we use the same, I won't go like stairway and stair landing, but we use the same methodology in the ADU, corner to corner, except for our mechanical room. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Um, others, I guess one of the things that I'm kind of struggling with myself you know, I'd, I'd like to hear the other commissioners on is the fact of just having a locked door, mm -hmm. knowing that I do have a full one bedroom with basically a bathroom, almost like a standalone one bedroom apartment on the other side of that locked door. And knowing that, yes, we can say we're locking the door, but you know, right now we don't, how, how do we enforce that? How do we regulate that? Um, you know, that becomes a question because if that door is unlocked, then it becomes larger than the 600 square feet. And I, you know, so I think the, you know, that's kind of where I am is, is kind of trying to figure out, is that sufficient or should it actually be a wall? Because it does have its own entrance into the studio from what I can see, you know, on the site plan. So if there was a wall there, then it would be very clear that I've got a studio that is only for the homeowners. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, a separate interest for the um, ADU that would become the rental. Um, so I don't know if you guys just you know, discussed that. I mean, it's not in here. I again, so I went, I went with the consultants report as as that, and they recommended a locked door. With that said, I do have some questions about how you enforce current locked doors, and we can't be the only ADU. And I certainly know that you can't go on knocking, looking at those. We're open for other recommendations besides a locked door if that's the comfort level that that the commission needs. And then I would have additional questions on like what would be the next steps after that to see the wall or whatever. But but so the locked door in here was just because that's what the recommendation was that said, if it's under 600 feet, a locked door. Um, no, I think the- Where's that provision? I was you know, Ryan. I was getting ready to say, it doesn't say- That was in the, in, the, in the original consultant's report at the last, as he went through all the things to say, Hey, yes, this complies, this is not applicable. It says at the very end, the recommendation is- Page 40. Thank you. That's what I was asking. How is the fire department going to rule occupancy based upon that door? If it would just be in a door, would they put occupancy based on the both rooms or would they do it on just the one? I questioned whether. 
Good question. I, I, I don't know. Um, and I'm going to read yeah, that's just question. so that the record is clear. I'm getting ready to do it. The either. consultant's report, Ryan's report. Yeah. Well, we work on these reports says, together, but uh, the planning commission should decide whether the door should remain locked at all times so the area is inaccessible to renters or if the opening should be closed off by a wall for permanent separation. Okay. That's slightly different than what you were presented minutes ago. Okay. Thank you for reading that out. And I, as I said, we're open to both solutions for what the comfort level needs to be to make this correct. I think if, if I may, it, to your question earlier, Jen, um, it, you know, given we're trying to uns, unsnarl, we're really trying to wrap our arms around short-term rentals and how we govern them and all of that. And so, so I share the concern that we need a wall there so that it's just, it, it's a no brainer. And it's sort of, as the, heaven forbid you guys sell as the ADU goes forward, it's compliant with the current um, regulations. I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. And especially if, I mean, I don't think we should make an exception for anyone. And if we were to make an exception, I think it would look bad to make one for somebody who sit, sits on the planning commission and city council. So, so I, oh, go ahead. I, um, I agree. Um, and my comment was going to be that uh, one of the lessons that I'm learning as we go through, as I continue to learn being a commissioner, and as we go through the short-term rental process, we need to stop exceptions. So um, I hope you know that I've not asked for an exception. Oh, I know that. Okay. I'm okay. Just, I'm, I'm not talking, asking for an exception. Yeah, but I'm just talking to everyone. And uh, I would also be comfortable uh, supporting this with um, a full wall. Okay. I, I, I'm a little um, unclear on what the wall accomplishes myself. I, I actually would be comfortable with the locked door because... I think the tough for a few reasons, one of which is I think the time to have required a wall would have been in 2020 when this was approved by the zoning administrator and said this complied with our zoning requirements as long as only 600 square feet were used for the living space and didn't say, you know, the part that's not used for living space has to be walled off. Um, it just makes me a little uncomfortable to, it feels a little bit like we're changing the rules um, you know, a few years later. Um, I also just unclear on how you would prevent someone um, with, a, you know, as our next unit is, a unit above a basement. I mean, what's to stop someone from renovating the base, you know, the, the garage, or I'm sorry, above a garage to stop someone from renovating a garage. I've certainly seen that done, not here, but in other places. And, you know, I just, I just think it's a, I think we might be going down a road that has some complications and issues with it in an effort to, to go one direction, we end up going the other direction and have a hard time being consistent down the line and aren't consistent with what we've done in the past, so. I, my only, I, I don't know how to basically um, evaluate all of these decisions that we made in the past. Um, and what I do know is that if we start now in terms of just enforcing um, uh, the ordinances and the rules, then that's all we can do going forward and apply the same standards to everybody. I, I completely agree. And I guess I'm not clear on why the wall is needed to do that. Well, that's, I think if I can speak, yeah. I would, I was kind of taking a step back like you're saying, if you went back to the original approval, but you know, at the time, if this came before us to today as an original approval, we would have required a wall, in my opinion. We would not have allowed them to say, okay, you're going to be able to build and just have an open door that you can lock if when you when you choose to rent it or you know to use it for anything other than your immediate family, because it's over the 600 square feet. You know, the can we go through I mean. I can't speak for everyone, but I'm guessing since we say 600 square feet maximum for an ADU, if it was coming in front of us, we would have had to say it's 600 or 768 square feet. But they didn't say it back then. I do understand. But if well, we... just to be clear, the regulations say it took me a while for this to click with me. They say 700, 600 square feet or, of course, a lesser amount of livable, livable right. area. So they don't say the. <clears throat> 
but you have to admit has to be 600 square feet but isn't the, the building isn't saying. the studio fully livable yes so the studio itself that 115 square feet is fully livable it has a bathroom it has kitchen it has no kitchen oh, it doesn't have a kitchen no it it, it has a bathroom bathroom well, I think livable, at least as intended by the city just a mere three years ago, was used for living space. Yeah. I don't think the condition of it was what being evaluated. But wouldn't but the space, the hundred the studio is livable space. So if the I mean, that was where the second bedroom was. Well, no, I think what Cindy said in her 2020 memo, the explanation was that she said it's some, it, some of the space has to be used for something else, such as storage. Right. So it's. That would be correct. You know, again, she was saying storage. And I know that they're you know, now talking about just having a one bedroom rental, but originally it was. You know, written up as a two bedroom rental, which kind of indicated that the original thought was that it wasn't going to be storage. Right. But I think, yeah. you know, I think and so it's, and again, I guess it's, it's the concept. And I know you're saying, well, what do we do with others? I'm not aware of other ADUs that exceed the space where they have a locked door. So I can't really say how do we regulate, you know, those type of situations. Um, you know, a locked door. Is it's a door, but at the same time, it can be unlocked at any, at any given time. A wall cannot be walked through. Devil's so advocate, the guy can walk in the outside door of the studio. Exactly. And there's no question that you, because you got two sure. doors, it's just a matter right. of, yeah. Just trying to cover all the points here. Yeah. Do we have any other questions for? The applicant. Seeing none, do we have a motion? Or do we want to move the motion um, regarding? Because obviously, you want you want us to move forward with a decision. Yeah. So uh, our our goal remains to move forward. So I don't if don't know what my role is in this segment. If we need to say that we're willing to. Don't know, put a wall in. I don't know what that actually means with that, with the existing, but to put a wall in. I don't know if it needs to be edited, if that's the comfort level needed. Again, I'm not asking for an exception. No, I think if 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 they if there was a if it was a consensus that that needed to be a part of the approval, then it would be contingent upon you know that occurring. You know, but that's going to be up to my fellow you know commissioners to decide. You know, do we want you know, does anything need to go into the, you know, if we were to approve, uh, you know, if we wanted to have any type of uh, additional language, you know, that would, would require, you know, such a thing besides a locked door. I'll make a motion. I move to approve the uh, applicant based upon it being a one bedroom uh, request and having a wall uh, fixed kind of permanent wall in the uh, space in between the studio and the living area as the two exceptions. Okay, so we have a Not exceptions, but contingent, contingent items. So the motion is for the approval with the contingency that a wall is added instead of a locked fixed door. wall, and, and that it says one uh, one bedroom application as opposed to the two that's currently there. Mr. Chair, I think our city attorney had something maybe to touch on conditions. Yeah. Okay. Oh, conditions. Condition. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. There you go. Yep. Yep. Yes. <laughs> conditions. Okay, we had a motion and it was seconded. Yes, so it was made, seconded. Oh, seconded by Gaunt. Then I would ask that the clerk do a roll call vote. Anderson? Approved. Badger? Yes. Broker? Yes. Gaunt? Yes. Lachey? No. 
in man's. Yes. Um, thank you. Do I follow up with Ryan on like what the next steps are for that? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. I'll work with you on permit and all that follow up. Yep. Next item. All right. The next item under old business is the short term rental task force update. It will be a verbal update, and I will ask the first our commission member and the task force chair, Anderson, to give us a verbal update. And then I'll also ask if Ryan has anything to add. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, you know, we're, we're making good progress. We had our second meeting this afternoon um, within uh, the McKenna folks as before joined us, um, starting to look at some high level data on comparable cities, um, you know, good discussion around, um, you know, kind of grounding information. So uh, Ryan walked us through what Sagatuck's current ordinances are. Uh, McKenna walked through, gave kind of their perspective. Um, we talked about what cities are comparable. Um, it was only a couple of hours ago and I should have made notes, but um, it was uh, a good discussion. We had a lot of comments, um, but actually both people very supportive, similar to what we've heard in these meetings and, you know, um, raising the importance of their investments in the city. We also had a number of people um, comment on sort of the pain of having a lot of short-term rental neighbors. Um, looking forward, we're gonna focus on uh, each of the task force members gonna send to Ryan sort of, you know, positives, negatives, um, you know, opportunities that we can start Collecting that information, that will be a living document. Um, as we learn more, we can add to that. And as we get in um, data from um, the community, we can add that as well. Uh, we're going to talk about um, engagement um, plans. So we'll next meeting really dig into sort of how we'll engage our different stakeholders and the kinds of information we want to get. And then importantly, what other data we want McKenna to dig into, especially looking at some economic impact, because we didn't, um, that's not part of what we initially agreed to with them, but we know that there's a need for that. Ryan, what else? So I, I think well said, uh, Madam Chair. So. <laughs> it's good. It's, it's a, you know, I think it will be a, uh, an interesting ride for all of us, but I, I, I feel like people are open-minded and um, respectful and it's, it's good. The, no, part, the part of the meeting that um, um, I was particularly, well, I was impressed with the meeting um, for all of the reasons that Holly stated, but I also was very interested in that uh, McKenna had provided a number of cities with beginning to populate relevant data. Um, and I thought it was encouraging that the task force actually agreed on a number of cities to uh, begin to build this database from. So we have a good base of comparison. Right. So, okay. and I think too, you know, understanding the need for Saga Tuck to okay. just sort of have our definitive set of baseline data. Um, which is far easier said than done given. Um, yes. We haven't had Ryan here the whole time. And, so and I, and also what I like comment on is, and I saw it was good, I, all the rows and all the different cities, but I, I was more intrigued by the columns and how some of those columns had real particular uh, flavor to things that we're dealing with and could lead to some good uh, ideas. More than the rows was the columns, I thought. Right. It is yep. types of types of STRs. Was that's one of the things that we did kind of discuss is that the members of the task force to you know, be looking at that and you know making notes, you know, and kind of circling things for as we get further into the process. Because I think the community as well as the members of the task force, They're everyone, joking. we feel like okay, we need to identify the issues. But there's so many people who think we know what the issues are. Let's start talking about mm -hmm. how to address it. And you know, right, they, we are you know, to and, that point. Yeah. And with our leader here, um, Chairman Anderson. 
you know, they're being very diligent along with Ryan on trying to make certain that everyone understands, you know, the foundation that we're currently working with. So even with, when somebody was questioning, why are we going over the ordinance and the application? I'm like, look, does everyone understand what you have to do currently, you know, to have a short-term rental? And so uh, I thought it was very positive. And I think the next couple of ones will really start to move in a direction where we'll start to talk about how do we take it now to the community? Had an interesting discussion, and we talked about it here when we were talking about the resolution for city council is um, residents and then um, other stakeholders who aren't residents and voters. And um, and it's a, you know, I can argue that both ways. And I mean, we need to listen, obviously, to people who have a vested interest in the community who, who aren't voters and residents, but, um, but we also... Um, especially council is elected. And so they also need to really specifically listen to what the constituents say. So I think that will be, you know, we just need to be mindful of that as we go through the process and probably give opportunities to both to both yes. and separately so that we can assure people that we've considered. And know. I think it would, you know, as a member of the task force, I will also say, I think it would be interesting if we had a forum geared towards citizens only, and then when it's open to those who own but aren't voting citizens, to see if you are getting, you know, similar or different. Yeah. Um, you know, which is I think that's a great idea, because one of the things that I found interesting about the meetings that I've attended about the short term rental issue is, people who are residents introduce themselves as, you know, I'm so-and-so, I live at such and such address in, in Saugatuck. And then people who, who are realtors or, or not from the area, immediate area, just aren't, don't say where they're from. It's just, just, an just interesting <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're supposed to get both, but sometimes, sometimes they get up to the microphone, they start going and you, just yeah. don't, you don't want to stop them and say, excuse me, where, where do you live? And right. Ali, I had a comment with Steve earlier. I was going to make it later, but I think it's good right now. One of the comments that have come through some of this doing this was uh, wanting to make sure that we took care of the after work crowd, some of the people that can't get to your earlier right. meeting. Mm -hmm. And I know our meetings later and as we get to summer, we have trouble getting any participation in this one, it appears. But if if and if you can work that out, I'm I'm willing to switch. If well, the one thing that we were discussing and how it's going to raise with you was at least maybe consider that the third meeting the third Thursday, which would be the second meeting of the month, be five to seven, and then we go seven to nine, because the staff's here anyway until seven o'clock. And then we could have one three to five and one five to seven. Yeah, I think, and I think as we get into some of the public meetings, um, we definitely will need to hold some of those in oh, the evenings nice. and weekend, or, you know, just make sure I don't want to commit you to weekends um but <laughs> yeah. um but to um you know make sure we do reach different times for folks so, chairman Mance, yes. um this is great I, I i just think that this is just on the right track and i've i've been watching as a very interested observer on the process and um do a lot of research on what other communities in the area are doing as well as outside of the state and um the thing is, is there's not one model that fits every place. And I think what we're doing fits Saugatuck. Um, I think two things. One is the engagement you mentioned. We have to be on that. And I'm willing to volunteer my time to go around and knock on doors of people I know that live here that don't necessarily get online. They don't have email. They don't, but they have an opinion about this. And I think it's at the end of the day, in the fall, when this report comes back, um, I, I'm just going to be... Um, if someone comes up to me and says, you know, Russ, no one ever came and talked to me about this. That's going to be, you know, that's, that's a missing, that's a missed opportunity. And number two is that I've had several people now that have come back who live outside of state, but have been renting their homes as vacation rentals, they call them for years. They're coming back and opening up their homes and they've come and they've talked to me and they've said, are you talking about different categories of rentals? And I said, well, I, I everything was on the table. It's, yeah, it's beginning to be discussed. And I said, there's people that have been doing this for, you know, literally 60, 70 years, and they consider themselves to be different. And they're, they've been here, their family's been here for, you know, a long, long time. And I think that they're an important voice to make sure that they're heard as well, because they have a perspective. So I think I, the engagement's incredibly important. Yeah, you know, and we're definitely seeing different ca categories of short-term runners. And some of them are the second home folks, um, people who just own a few, you know, people for whom this is their business and they've got a bunch. So uh, we need to consider all of that for us. And I would have to say that to McKenna's credit, 
you know, when they, this is the list they presented today, like one of the columns tried to identify, do they have categories? Like a couple of towns had a tourist category versus a homeowner category. And there's other cities who have done that. You know, if you are the primary homeowner, you're using it the majority of the time and you're, you know, renting you know, two weeks a year, should you be viewed differently than, you know, an LLC that mm -hmm. owns something that is renting it, you know, it's on BRB. So I, so I, yeah, I think that but those are, and we hope to be able to hear them. The question is going to be how many public forums, you know, you know, can we have, but I'm all for trying to get out. I know Holly is too, and the whole task force, but I think it's positive, And I thank you for the update. Moving on to new business, because I know we got some people sitting out there going, when are they getting to us? <laughs> First item on new business is the 703 Pleasant Street, which will require a public hearing for a special land use request for a rented accessory dwelling unit, as well as a site plan review. So knowing that this will require a public hearing, I will open up at this time, if, if you're ready, clerk. A public hearing to discuss 703 <clears throat> Pleasant Street and their application for our special land use accessory dwelling unit and their site plan review. Before we uh, have any presentation by the applicant, I'll ask for a, su a summary by the zoning administrator. If Brian, would you please present that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you indicated, uh, the applicant, um, uh, Mr. Hager, has uh, applied for a special land use approval to rent an accessory dwelling unit uh, at 703 uh, Pleasant Street, which is in the uh, community residential um, zoning district. Uh, there's a, uh, a garage with a, a second floor accessory dwelling unit living space that was uh, actually approved back in uh, 2013 um, on this property. Uh, the square footage of the second uh, floor living space provided by the applicant was 575 square feet. Um, at the time of the application and the, the memo, there wasn't a detailed drawing with measurements that were provided. However, since the, that time, the applicants provided a, a rough sketch um, that the, the deputy clerk was able to, to show you this evening. Uh, the owner, uh, the current owner of the property, uh, wishes to manage the, the rental of uh, an accessory dwelling unit uh, in the ADU space above the garage. Uh, there's a memo provided in your packet, which outlines uh, staff and consultant analysis of your uh, standards that you have to consider uh, this evening. Um, the applicant is here to present his application. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, Mr. Chair. Very good. Does anyone have any questions for the zoning administrator before we invite the applicant up? Seeing none, if we could have the applicant, Bruce, um, come up and just kind of give us your presentation on the application um, you've submitted. Yes, I mean, uh, well, basically, we're we um, we bought the home in in, uh, in October of last year, and uh, my wife and I, um, and so while we'd be using the space for for friends and family to visit, we uh, we also would like to have the uh, the opportunity to to rent it out. Um, no more than three people. We think it's a one bedroom studio. Um, and it's uh, and we're you know not interested in having large uh, party house or anything like that, but we uh, but we think around three you know three people max, um, and then we will be uh, you know looking to look at I guess working with Jock or I'm sorry is it Jaqua? Yeah, Jaqua. Jaqua. Jockwell, Rental, yep. Jockwell Realtor, yes, thank you. And uh, we're working with them to to manage, help us manage the property. And nice. it will be going through all the the the, uh, the inspections by the fire department and, uh, you know, living up to code. So. Very good. One, it's a beautiful home. Congratulations. Oh, on, thank on you. The purchase. Thank you. It is um, it's kind of one of those homes that's very well known you know, in the city. And so congrats on that. I am curious. I should because it doesn't really matter, but your thing when it said 575, when I was looking at the diagram that's inside, because I think one of the questions was, you know, how would we verify the 575? On page 59 in our kit. This is what I, uh, I just did a rough sketch um, because it, there's a, a dormer and slanting roof. Right. Um, it cuts back on the, the, uh, the living floor space. So you can look at the total... Uh, dimensions of the footprint of the building it's uh, at least on the inside it's 23 by 27 feet which right. gives you over 600 feet 
but if you subtract out those spaces, um, then you then you get uh, roughly 575. It's not exact. Right, because the reason I was asking is because when, when I saw like what was built above the garage, the, like on that loft room where they're doing like it was 476. So I was like, is it 476 or 575? I don't know. But if, if, that, if that loft room represented kind of the one bedroom, then it would actually be closer to 476, which is still well below the 600. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I and I'm I'm not even so you know I, I'm no expert on on some of this, but um, you know the stairs I'm not sure is concluded as uh, right, that correct. included as living yeah because I mean again what, what was showing here if I was calculating it was actually less than what you were showing there, but either way it still was kind of below. But I think one one of the questions was how would we be assured that it was smaller? But based upon at least if this was the drawing where it had the two car garage with the loft space above. Then you would be looking at approximately 476 to 480 square feet. Yes, I mean it's a it's a little different from what the original plan that, okay. that was submitted. I think. Oh, so maybe it's a little. Yeah. Bit. Just go with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Is that drawing in our packet? No. So that's what he submitted since the the, the packet went out. Yeah. As we noted that. I knew his his numbers. Wow. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. His number might be a possible concern. So, yep. so I'm going to ask a basic math question. So we multiply 27 by 23, mm -hmm. which would be the exterior, which is six of 21 that he has up there. But he's indicating that's the you know you can see the dormer where the tables at is actually where a dormer kind of juts out, and so really the uh, it's it's. It, Okay, so it's, there's it's quite the, a bit of space that he's included in that, you know, 27 by 23. That's really not actual. Right, space. And, and the stairs okay. are there also. Okay. And then if you go back to like what was originally proposed, and that page 59, it's even smaller. So, are do we have standards for how applicants measure stuff? Because. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I think where some of the we just showed two different ways. I think where some of the confusion comes in, uh, and I think uh, the, the last applicant um, pointed this out is that so. If, um, so if you look at page forty-four, your packets, and item three kind of lists the actual language from the zoning ordinance that talks about like you know how are we measuring. Uh, an accessory dwelling unit and and it starts off with talking about you know the minimum being 375 square feet of gross floor area um and that it can't be you know larger than 600 feet square feet of gross floor area and there's a definition in the zoning ordinance what gross floor area, floor area is and that differs a little bit from the way this paragraph ends where it says for purposes of this section the floor area of an accessory dwelling unit is the total finished floor area intended for um living sleeping bathing eating and cooking so there's a little bit of conflict there between right what the zoning ordinance says is gross floor area and then that kind of qualifier at the end of that 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 section there um so i think this is where some of these, these issues are arising arising from i'm sure that is yeah yeah the reason yeah um, are there other questions for the applicant before yeah please um so having not been inside the unit, there is a single dormer. And yet I look at the, I drove by and I look at the exterior of your garage and there's two dormers. That's it again. That's it. Yeah, that's incorrect. That was the original drawing uh, when they submitted the plan, but they had obviously changed it. Um, so it's a, I just drove by it. Wait a minute. There, I, I, there's only one dormer when I just drove by it. I, I'm just trying to remember. Yeah, I mean, I unless you, yeah, there's only one one okay. former. So yes, okay, great. I, Look at page. I can show you. you um, no, that's fine. Or I believe you. I yeah. Okay. Um, it is one. Um, yeah, there it is. The one former. Mark sixty four. Yeah, it's on the screen. Wow. Yeah. Correct. Right. There's that's what it looks like. It's the one door right. versus okay. That's right. Versus the two that it's was on that original drawing. Got it. it. Thank you. Um, that actually, I just this is just out of curiosity because it's a. I was confused by that too, <laughs> visual too. Is there a requirement, Ryan, that um, 
and I know this isn't the applicant's fault if it was supposed to have happened, but were you you're supposed to update the schematics if if they change after the per, after the permit's been issued? Well, there, if there was going to be a change, it should have occurred, you know, um, and been approved as part of the approval process. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that, you know, plans do change at times, but there's there's a process to go through to amend or change those I approvals. See. Um, I'm not sure. I, I can't follow it. A chain here where you know this change was uh approved to be in this way um and that's where i think you know his application then said 575 square feet which differed from the the, the original plans and that's where the, the request came to okay what is your actual layout so yeah yep and okay point taken i no i was more thinking for yep. the future actually i think like, you're, you're exactly yep <laughs> and where is the access to the upstairs unit from the exterior, is there? A, there's a there's a door. There's a door. Uh, and that little bush. You take the stairs. Go up. around the side. No, so you're like right the there. Side. Right. Thank you. Okay. Because yeah. again, well, the schematic submitted shows the door in the front, but you've got a shrub there. So okay, it's around the side. Thank you. Oh yeah, I see. There's like a little walkway. Right. Yeah. Yes. I, I didn't want to have to think this. I had to go into the garage proper and do an interior stairway. Flipped. Is it flipped? Is the door on a different side than shown here? It looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the uh the actual footprint of the building is correct. Um correct. It's on page 59. Yep. If we don't have any more questions for the applicant, I will. Thank him. And then we will move on to the public comments if we have any in regards to this application. Um, participants, if they have public comments, are asked to come up to the microphone, state their name and their address, and limit their comments you know, to the three minutes. Do we have anyone in the room that's looking? I don't think so. Do we have anybody online? No. So we have no public comments from anyone. So I will close the. Uh, Public, public comment portion um, saying that we didn't have any. We'll move on then to, so we public comments were closed then, and I guess what time is it? Well, and if I, if I can, Mr. Chair, just note that, uh, just to make sure everybody saw it in your packet, that there was a letter from uh, Brian Shipper regarding this this project. Um, I wrote that down. Uh, he was unable to attend the meeting um, this evening. Um, he offered his conditional support um, but wanted to provide some uh, greater context. Um, he indicated that Pleasant Street is a narrow street, that it's 18 feet wide, and of the 19 homes um, with uh, on Pleasant Street, that fiber consistently occupied as short-term rentals. Um, said on weekends, four regularly have more than four vehicles parked on the property, uh, that short-term short rental tenants in these properties regularly park additional vehicles on Pleasant Street on both sides of the street. Um, so because these homes have a large number of bedrooms, um, specifically marketed to and regularly used for event-related accommodations, uh, such as bachelor and bachelorette parties, family uh, functions, and school reunions. Um, so he had concern about street parking being limited or, and it didn't, you know, wondered if that could be, you know, not permitted on that runners vi routinely violate guidance, uh, which leads to residents having to enforce the restrictions. Uh, he said it's of particular concern because emergency vehicles are frequently blocked from access, creating risk to providing emergency medical and fire services. Um, he mentioned that he owns a, a permitted short-term rental uh, in Saugatuck, uh, and he's inclined to support property owners being able to use their properties as they desire. Um, an owner using residential property as a source of income is not equated with a resident being able to enjoy where they live. This is especially true uh, for those who have purchased properties, including on Pleasant, Pleasant Street, a specific purpose of converting them to short-term rentals to use as a source of income. Um, so that a property owner deriving income from a private resident should never lead placing a resident at greater risk of accessing emergency services uh, or their home being damaged or destroyed by fire. Um, he talks about another city that he owns property in that passed a comprehensive set of changes to their short-term rental uh, guidelines, um, which prohibits short-term prohibits, I'm sorry, which was successful in changing public sentiment away from prohibiting short-term rentals. Um, 
He said this will raise the short term rental density on the street to 37% um, from 20%. And that other friends who have left Pleasant Street have indicated they don't, they don't miss it, attributing the poor quality of life specifically to the proliferation of short-term rentals, believes the merits add additional emphasis. Um, said homeowners are leaving what is generally considered to be a desirable residential street in the city of Saugatuck because short-term rentals have negatively impacted their quality of life. Brian. Thank you, Ryan. Yep. Yes, from Brian Shipper, and I had, had noted that, and so thank you for bringing that up, because one of the things that... You know, I think he's raising some you know, good points. The one thing that I'm sure Holly would probably also say is upon reading it, it's like many of these are points that will kind of be addressed by the short-term rental task force. But for us here at the planning commission, you know, that, that none of those rules it currently exist as to whether or not you have to take in consideration right. how many are on a street or, you know, if they park on the road, I mean, there's more than two spaces, you know, uh, on property or for it. So, uh, but they are very valid points and I do hear, so I. Yeah, I think we should tuck that in the uh, short-term rental, kind of our stack of stuff, um, especially the the safety concerns I think are troubling and maybe flagging, um, you know, with the fire department or whatever safety folks in the city. Um, Cause I, I drove down the street to it. It is, if you had cars parked on both sides, you'd be up a crook if you needed an ambulance or fire. Well, it's the same thing as Main Street. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is a great point. I think that the this will come up as a result of some of the discussions at the short term round. But I will tell you that the city, I've been involved in some discussions already with public safety, fire, and police to try to address some of the issues that we already have. Um, Pleasant's one example. Maine's a great example. If it, it's just, it's, it's completely unsafe, and the city needs to take action on that. Right before the short-term rental will probably come to the same conclusion, but the city already has an issue that needs to be addressed. And, right. and um, personally, I'm not going to wait on the short-term rental. No disrespect intended, but there's an issue. Oh, no, soon is good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it did strike me that this is an issue. If you can't get through when someone's on the street, it kind of doesn't matter if it's a short-term renter or someone else. Right. right. You can't, yeah. it's not a good idea. So I'm just reminding <laughs> the commission, you know, that yeah, we, we have to follow like what is what is currently in the ordinances and are the yeah. ordinances met um, outside of things that may come down the line um, later on this year. I think our opportunity to ask the applicant questions has passed, but um, it might be worth just noting to encourage, assuming this is approved, uh, short-term rentals. It looks like there is space to park behind the garage doors um, so as to not contribute to the parking issue and maybe follow up with a neighbor to that effect. And that's wise. Yeah, and I would add to that saying that uh, though I've not personally met the applicant based on the comments that I heard this evening, and 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 I think that he's heard from us clearly that there's things to be concerned about, that um, he'll be respectful of that up on Pleasant Street. So, do we have any additional deliberation? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There is a parking space that we that we have that's um, just off the street. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah, that's good to know. I mean, it's I say correctly yeah, because I know the property. Sort of the uh, as well as all the space we have. In fact, your pri the prior owner came to the city and went through a whole thing about getting that exact spot. So, um, yeah, that was a whole, I'll say a whole thing. Whole process. Yeah. <laughs> the technical term. Yeah, yeah whole process. <laughs> Um, I, I just since this is not germane to this particular applicant, but since you're talking about parking, um, one of the sides of our house is, is on Main. Um, I, I have to tell you, I've been quite surprised for the 10 years that I've lived here that there are so many streets that have parking that allow parking on both sides of the street. And so for you to say the city will address it, you being on the city council, um, that's very heartening to me that, that uh, the city is going to look at Main Street. I find it appalling that Pleasant Street has parking on both sides, and I know a fire truck or an ambulance could get, not get down that street um, either to enter or exit um, in, in the case of emergency. And, and I think we are, as a city, uh, 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 very lucky that uh, uh, a horrible situation has not yet happened on numerous streets in our city. Um, which seems to be through neglect or something else that that just allows parking on both sides of a street, um, which have 
historically been not wide enough for parking on both sides of a street. And the other thing that happens, people do, they park up on the berm. They park, mm -hmm. you know, they, they'll park almost their entire car up on uh, what I call my yard. It's of course a city property, but they'll, they have no problem parking up on, up on, uh, uh, off the street uh, for that very purpose. And um, so I think I'm, I'm heartened that uh, the uh, city council member who is on our planning commission is, is going to uh, address this uh, uh, issue separately from short-term rentals in terms of, of uh, restricting parking to one side only of certain streets in this community. And I probably was remiss before I opened it up for deliberation. I was going to ask um, CJ if you wanted to at least disclose to myself and the yeah, it went too fast. I, we talked about it before. So I'm I uh, am three houses west and down the hill from this property. Um, so we talked about it, and if I don't feel I have a financial interest, I'm not a bordering property. I just finished my Michigan State training, and Spart <laughs> Spartyville and Saugatuck have a lot in common. Right, right. Um, so I was going to bring it up earlier, and then we just, right. just went right into it. But and so one of the things that we discussed in the training we just had earlier this afternoon is that. Although I believe, and I think uh, zoning com zoning commissioner will also attest that there's nothing in our ordinance as far as that being an actual conflict, but it was noted that from a legal standpoint, we could actually vote as a commission, you know, to recognize that, and, and we have the ability to say that we agree that he's not in conflict and can remain and vote on this issue, or we can um, vote that he you know needs to recuse himself. I personally don't think that you have a conflict given where your home is and where the home is on Pleasant Street. Do we have anyone else? Because if not, I'll ask you if we would vote that he has no conflict. And for all those in favor. Well, well you want to make, yeah, somebody will want to make, make that a motion. motion. Yep. Okay, that's true. I will make a motion that Planning Commissioner C.J. Badrack is not in conflict with this application. I'll second. Well, I'm not supposed to. I'm sorry. I just said. All those in favor of the motion say yes. Yes. Opposed, no. So we see no conflict. So you can go ahead if you had anything, <laughs> anything you wanted to add now to the deliberation. And I apologize. I should have said that before yeah. we started it. Well, we got that on record anyway. Now the <laughs> deliberation is over. <laughs> so, given the fact that I think you know, um, it looks like everybody's had a chance to kind of review or discuss, um, do we have a motion? I would like to make a motion that the application for special land use permit for a short-term rental for 703 Pleasant Street as presented be approved. Second. Well, I'm sorry. Your motion said for a short-term rental. Um, I just want to make sure that, yeah, maybe want to clarify that the request this evening is yeah, for a special land use request for a rented accessory dwelling unit. Okay. Yeah. Apologize. Um, Could I hear the corrected motion, please? So want to restate. Yeah. So um, I will uh, reamend my motion. My motion to approve the application for a short-term rental unit, or pardon me, a special land use, special land use for auxiliary dwelling unit. Very accessory. Yes. Thank you for seven hundred three Pleasant Street as presented. Second. Did I get it? Yeah, I understand that you, you made a motion to uh, approve the application for 703 Pleasant Street, their request for a uh, rented accessory dwelling unit. Right. And with that, we'll ask for a roll call on this one, please. Anderson? Yes. Badger? Yes. Broker? Yes. Gardner? Yes. Donk? Yes. Lachey? Yes. Emmy? Yes. The application has been approved. Congratulations. Welcome. Sure. Next item on the agenda, which will also require a public hearing, is the proposed zoning ordinance amendment regarding the temporary waterfront commercial development and construction moratorium. For this, we will open up a new public hearing. Go over the public hearing for new business item B, the zoning change for the temporary waterfront commercial development and construction moratorium, and ask that the zoning administrator please try to give us an update on the purpose behind this and what we're going to be looking at here this evening. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Uh, as you know, on, on March 27th, the uh, City Council adopted a uh, police powers ordinance uh, that established a temporary waterfront uh, commercial development and construction moratorium, uh, which was a moratorium on permitting approval and consideration of new building construction, existing building expansion and site development, including parking and site improvements in all waterfront locations in the Water Street North, Water Street South, uh, Water Street Commercial and Resort uh, Zoning Districts. Um, and now that the city council has adopted that uh, police powers ordinance, um, and, and as we discussed at your, um, your, your last meeting, based on some uh, recent uh, court decisions, uh, staff and legal counsel recommended the planning commission um, review and consider a corresponding uh, zoning, zoning ordinance amendment to make a recommendation uh, to the council on whether or not to adopt um, a corresponding uh, zoning ordinance amendment along those same lines. So um, before you this evening is uh, that proposed corresponding zoning ordinance amendment. Um, happy to answer any questions that the, the planning commission may have. And Ryan, I believe this is in line with what was already approved by police power with the city council. Correct, correct. the language essentially mirrors that, th yes. that language, except this would be a, an, a temporary amendment essentially to your, your actual zoning ordinance. Right. Any questions by any of the all commissioners? Has everyone had an opportunity to read through? Mm -hmm. And would anyone like to make a motion? Well, we just want to check for any public. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. That's right. I just realized there's nobody here. Yep, we got to do the public. Yeah. We have to do it. Sorry. We just try to get this thing. <laughs> hey, I understand. It's been a long day. So we'll open up for public comment. I do apologize. So public comments, if you would like to make a comment regarding this proposed item, please come up to the microphone if you're here in the room or if you're online, which we do not have anyone online. Looks we have one person online, it looks like. Oh, she, she did not have her hand. Hi. Jane. Duly noted. <laughs> Seeing no one in the room addressing the podium and online i do not see the ipad it's name? jane oh I'll jane just, yeah. um, with the hand raised so i will make the assumption that we have no public comments in regards to this of uh, supporting or opposing the general comments i think were made at some of the council uh, meetings so we can kind of close the public comments at this time and then move on to com commission deliberation. And if we don't have any deliberation necessary, I would entertain a motion. I would like to make a motion to recommend the adoption of an amendment to the zoning ordinance establishing a temporary waterfront commercial development and construction moratorium. Support. Motion by Anderson, second by Lachey. We'll ask the clerk to make this a roll call also, please. Anderson? Support. Frederick? Yes. Broker? Yes. Gardner? Yes. John? Yes. Lachey? Yes. Henry? Yes. It passes unanimously. This moves us on to the last item that we have for new business, the Waterfront Development Zoning Ordinance Review. And an update. Well, that, which I believe right now came out as a new. Ryan, were you going to handle this or? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, uh, uh, David and Jurassic, uh, late, um, or actually early this evening, uh, unfortunately, wasn't able to, to make it as expected. And um, he's been hard at work, kind of. Uh, Going through your, your your court and ordinances and is on track, you know, as part of that 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 review, um, he anticipated uh, during this meeting, um, kind of discussing with you maybe some additional um, having some additional discussion about public engagement and, and surveys. And so, um, the short term rental task force had some uh, homework that was given to them, um, and Mr. Dross has asked that the planning commissioners be assigned uh, some homework as well. Um, what he's done is, is written a, a memo that's uh, that was put on. Um, uh, your desk, I suppose, is what it is for this evening. On your desk, uh, just prior to your meeting, that essentially kind of uh, outlines some potential questions that you could ask as part of a visual preference survey and provide some more detail on that. Um, so what he would uh, prefer is that in the next uh, in the next two weeks that each of you review those uh, questions 
and then provide me with some um, feedback on uh, what you like, what you don't like, additions, subtractions, any thoughts that you have, and then I'll compile all that information and um, provide it to Dave. Um, and then at your next meeting, um, have a little bit of a, a deeper dive on, on what maybe the final survey looks like, next steps with public engagement, and then some further discussion about um, where we're at with uh, the review. Very good. Yeah, I think the you know, knowing that our next meeting will be you know, whatever date in June, you know, but we are, you know, this is something we are trying to get finished by September. So the request of trying to get stuff over to Ryan and to David in the next couple of weeks, as far as what you're thinking in regards to the survey and thoughts on how we might want to conduct the survey. I know we've had some really good ideas already circulated amongst the commission of, you know, do we have a online survey? Do we have it mailed? Do we put it in the commercial record? Do we have a QR code, you know, on certain, you know, signs in the city? All of these, I think, you know, could be items, you know, that we would, you know, want to consider. And then as moving forward, you know, the public forums, I guess the one thing I would would also put in my notes, you know, at least for Dave, would be, can we have any type of renderings of different, you know, maybe like prototype drawings of, some ideas regarding, you know, the waterfront um, that people would be able to kind of say, well, do they approve or not to approve? The one thing that I was discussing um, with Ryan, you know, zoning administrator, as well as uh, Chris earlier today, and I would ask each of you to kind of take a look. Um, you know, we currently have, you know, the four different zones that are part of the moratorium. Um, you know, and some of the designs and some of the conversations that I've had so far with citizens, everybody's kind of got this idea as to what they would like to see, you know, as the waterfront. But we also need to kind of take a look and understand that the way that our current zoning is done, there's very different parameters between like our Water Street North versus our Water Street South versus our resort area. And, you know, with the way that so part of this whole thing, it's going to kind of lead into will be, you know, do we need to also be addressing, you know, what's what's currently in you know, the, the zoning and how, it, and if you were leaving the zoning in the way that it is, how would that affect? Because just as an example, Water Street North, they can build 100% lot coverage with no setback requirements, you know, whatsoever. Water Street South has limitations depending upon the type of the building. It could be 45%, 50%, or 65% lot coverage. They have setback requirements on each side as well as the fronts and backs. You know, so there's, things that we would have to address as we're going to the public, you know, as to, it almost falls, Bobby, I think a lot into the whole master plan uh, conversation. If we were saying, what would we like the waterfront to be five, 10 years from now, or when properties do change hands, or if they're making requests, you know, would that require us to be able to live with the existing um, zoning that's in place, or would we be required to kind of revise zoning after this is all over? Um, that would kind of give us the ability to say, hey, we're going to have a lot of non-conforming for a time period, but the long-term goal is this. And I'm just throwing that out as something I think each of us when we would kind of want to be aware of and be thinking of when we're thinking of going to the public engagement, because I really don't want to go to public and have everybody say that they want to have space between every building. And then for us to come back and say, well, everything north of Wicks Park is allowed to be 100% lot coverage. You know, they're used to it now, but again, before we start asking questions that if we get the answer that they want that, are we open to, you know, realizing what it may mean to be able to try to accomplish it? Well, I don't know if I said that right, but I'm just trying to. I, what I hear you saying, and as I'm looking at the survey, I think it's appropriate. And I worry about uh, raising expectations mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, for that very reason, I mean, there are X number of districts, they apparently each have a different set of rules. And we're generally asking big questions like, tell us your big ideas for the waterfront. Is, I don't know what that means, actually. And I think that, you know, like I was saying, if I was talking to the individuals that live in Water Street East at the north end that are in those townhomes, they would probably say, hey, I'd love to see the, a space between every building like we currently require on Water Street South. But, you know, they, they might say that's that's their opinion, but it's not what the current zoning, um, you know, or it's not how it's currently zoned, I should say. 
So it's something that as we move forward, because I think there's been a lot of, and I think you know, Russ is, Commissioner Gardner I think has made reference in the past, or maybe it was uh, CJ, you know, there's individuals that I've heard from that have talked about how they'd like to see like a boardwalk and public access, you know, from the very south all the way, you know, th up, you know, through the north end. Well, that becomes kind of like, well, that's a long-term goal, but, you know, how would we accomplish that given the fact that we, that would cut through, you know, three different zones that each have different requirements currently, unless we were willing to kind of go back and say, are we going to really look at an overall, you know, zoning change? And then what would that mean? And so it's, um, yeah, and it makes it easy to kind of understand why this is another one of those topics that's just been kicked down, <laughs> down the road for, for years. Right. So, you know, just to remind everybody, there is a public boardwalk all the way from the chain ferry landing all the way down to the very east end of Coughlin right. Park. So a vast majority of these districts are already open to public use. The space north of that will be incredibly difficult. I think it's a vision to do that, but it's the city has looked at that before. You, you know, there's various reasons why that hasn't been accomplished, but I think it's something that People would say try to get that, but that that would just be. I would probably put that at the achievable category of ten. Right, and I think that it kind of helps explain when I was asking the questions of how do we end up with the number of zones that we have was that we really tried to look at what was already in place when they rewrote those back in you know, 2010 or 12. Um, you know, for right for right or wrong, you kind of determined well that's what's already here, so we'll write that zone. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, and and I appreciate uh, Mr. Drasic's uh, uh, draft here. I think there's some good things here, but I agree with Commissioner Gaunt that when you say, "What are your big ideas?" Um, be interested to see what people would answer, how they would how they would answer that question. I'd be curious to hear what they uh, have to say. Um, I think really uh, the key here is to get this in a form that is available to everybody. Engage, kind of what we're talking about, the short-term rental task force. Engage with the people that have an interest in this. And um, you know, meet a, you know, as we suggested at previous meetings, have a have an open session at the gazebo or or meet down at the uh, you know meet down at the uh, launch ramp um, and just put this in front of people and let them know that we're looking for that feedback from them. Part of the concern is I think we should be talking seriously about asking council to give us another month for this. I think September is right. going to be it's going to be too difficult. short, given the fact that we'll really be yeah. discussing public forums and whatever our outreach is at probably the June meeting, if you get the ideas over in the next two weeks, so you know, to July. Um, but I think it's it's valid to kind of just determine as we are thinking about what we want to include like in a survey, you know, mm -hmm. to the public, you know, do we want to give them wide open options or do we want to kind of lay the parameters that we have to kind of work with what we already have and what do we envision kind of going forward or just you know, let them tell us what, what it is that they, would like to see, and then we can kind of explain why they can't have it, you know, if it came back saying. <laughs> well, I, I think that, I mean, I wasn't suggesting that we make these decisions tonight. I'm right, just right. Suggesting mm -hmm. yeah. that as each of us think about this, this over the next two weeks, exactly. Give feedback. Yep. Um, that's something we need to think about. I totally agree. I agree. And another thing that comes to my mind that was mentioned in case it's helpful to others as they look through, but living on the other side of the river. Um, the questions, just glancing at them, seem like they might be targeted to this side. And I think we are including the resort That's areas. Right. We might, I don't know, I'll look at it and think about that, but I agree. maybe that needs to be separately. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'd say whether you're in the east or west side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. I think it's, well, but it is yeah, a valid it's point. A sure. Yeah. It's yeah. a yeah. difference Absolutely. because, you know, it's something that, you know, especially when you take the time to actually go through and look at the zoning on the west side, you know, which, which, uh, and what's allowed there and you know I was even noticing like if you want to do a single family home on the river in that zone you have to come from the planning commission and for a special land use but you can have a single family home any place on the river over here I would think it would be like well I'd rather see a home on that side as you're looking at you know <laughs> but uh, but for the people who want to access it is important you know to kind of say what can they see on the other side mm -hmm. um, you know and I think that you know they need to be able to try to envision you know, that that also and maybe that's a separate separate part to the survey you know, yeah uh, potentially what lens are you looking at the waterfront from yes. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> maybe even as something as simple as adding are you a city of Saugatuck resident and adding a subpart 
which side, you know. Right. Yeah. Or just asking, having a, you know, what's your vision for the east side of the river, downtown Saugatuck versus the west side of the river in this zone? And then one thing that if we do the survey that I think would be helpful, because it took me a while to figure it out, is actually kind of identifying between what streets is Water Street, is Water Street North, Water Street South, you know, Water Street Commercial. Um, you know, so because the, the map is in there, but it's really kind of hard to kind of tell, especially on the other side of the river, where is that parcel that we'll be discussing on the west side? Yeah, so all very, very good comments. If, um, yeah, yeah. If you could individually at least pass along whatever, whatever you're thinking, that, that these, are, these are all good items. Uh, hopefully you could get that to me by June 1st. So that way Dave has some time to digest and, and kind of evaluate and, and put things um, together. And I, I think, you know, fair discussion related to, you know, it's, it's one thing to be working on like, you know, updated master plan language and be looking out 20 to 25 years. I can understand the perspective of saying, you know, in the immediate future with our zoning, um, where do we, we think, you know, uh, we want to be um, and setting realistic expectations. Um, Ryan, one question that I have, um, and it may just be me, um, is there any kind of simplified document that uh, basically maybe two pages that lays out those zones, those zoning districts? And um, uh, that makes it easy. I mean, I can read maps and I can go through all mm -hmm. the material you provide us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it would just be um, simpler, at least for me, if I had like two pages yeah. that laid out. So what you're really, right. The ordinance. So like the four zones that are part of right. the discussion just pulling what these current zoning is like almost like what we did for the short term rental just pulling it right out of the zoning right. or just putting it together in like one little packet um, yeah i can certainly pull you know those particular zoning districts in the language they have it's a little tricky in the sense that there's a lot of general regulations that would also apply um to those related to heights and uh, so um so there's going to be some additional things that um, you know, those particular zoning districts and their dimensional standards, and it's not all encompassing, I guess I should say. Um, but I think part of Dave's analysis, and I could talk with Dave about, you know, um, kind of one, ask him how he plans on laying this out and, and talking through right. with you. This is where we're at as far as each zoning district and what's allowed and what we want to. So let me let us work on that and see what we can put together for you. Yeah, maybe a table might yep. work. Yeah. Um, yep. You know, uh, check marks for all the all the heights if they're all the same, or I don't know. I'm just not. I'm yep. just yep. spitballing it. Public would like that too. That'd be good. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. So I think it comes down because you know what you're going to find like when you just go through like the zoning ordinances, it just kind of lays out you know what the lot yeah, coverage could be, the setbacks are. But then what Brian is referring to is when you get dead into the more specifics, it's got like the high requirements, what can be on a first floor, what can be on a second and third floor. Um, you know, so it's it's pulling it from multiple parts of our actual binders and the and the books. But I think it's, you know, that's definitely one of the things that we probably want to talk about because I know that's been one of the issues in other cities with water. You know, it'd be like just like with that height, you know, some people have felt, well, should they what what should be the height? You know, is it currently okay, or would you allow you know, higher, lower? It's, you know, those would be the type of questions that we'd ask the uh, citizens. I don't know what the answers are going to be, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but only Let's make sure I got it straight. Update questions and comments, and then ideas on how to engage the public. Here are the things you're looking oh, for. I think that's those are good. Ideas. Yep, good things for us to think about. Yeah. And uh, uh, back to my question about going back to council, I think we need another month. I, I, I really do. Yeah. What, what would be the best way for me to take that back to council or for the commission to take that back to council? Well, I, I guess, you know, the at least the police powers um, moratorium, you know, just have a mechanism to, you know, pass a resolution to to extend it. I mean, um, might wait correct me from all my perspective on it would be to keep working hard towards that goal. And see where you're at as you get closer to that date, and then evaluate at that time how much additional time may or may not be needed. Right, um, like the first week of September. At least work I mean, towards your, your six months, and then um, you know use the mechanism that you have at that point to determine if and how much time you extra time you need. Would be my my thought on that. 
need to ask for a month now and then another one later. Right. I'd rather really, I'd rather really wait closer to, and ask for the two we need. The first commission or the first council meeting or workshop in September, we'll have a real good idea. Or after our August meeting, we'll have a good idea. That's yeah. A good idea. Yeah. The key is just to be working towards doing what you indicated you're doing. Thank you. Nice, Chris. I would agree. If there's no additional comments, we'll close out <clears throat> the review and update, which moves us to the communications. And the only communication that I put in the wrong place was the letter we had from Brian in regards to 703. I don't know of any other communication that's outstanding. So then we have the report of the officers and the committees. And once again, you know, Ryan, I say continue great job on this report. Mm -hmm. um, You're a busy guy. Yeah. 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 Brian, it's true. Oh, can I ask him so a question? Uh, is the number of new STR applications slowing, it seems like? Yes. Okay. Yeah, pretty dramatically. I think I've received one probably in the maybe the last two weeks. Okay. Um, still getting a lot of calls. Um, there's some folks that think that we've stopped them all together. Uh, so some folks are calling like, hey, I hear you don't have them anymore. You're not allowing them anymore. And so I have explained to a lot of folks that current regulations are still on the books. We're processing them as per our normal processes. But um, yes. It, it, Ryan, it, my question was kind of similar to that because I went through and I was just noting all the ones that were listed as due STRs. And I can count those up. Do you know how many if any of the ones that came in since like March have been approved and are off your list now, or are all of them yeah. still pretty much on the list? Um, probably about half are probably off the list. Uh, we've moved quite a few. Um, and then the fire department updated me on Monday and has the rest scheduled with the exception of two. So, so if um, we were looking, I'm just curious and it kind of relates back to the task force, but since I was on this, but then when that, chart was generated when we showed, you know, as of March, the 244 licenses. Mm -hmm. What would you estimate now for licenses, an additional six, 10? I don't want to, yeah, I'll okay. have to get back to that. No, yeah, the, the list that McKenna has was from late, was like April 27th. Right. Um, so it, there has been, you know, a, a, I remember issuing certificates with, with approvals I had from the fire department right before I did that report to try to get the most up-to-date data, but yeah, uh, yeah, five to ten is probably accurate. Because yeah, I was just curious, because if I add, if I added up all the new ones, assuming that they got approved, new or existing mm -hmm. that were not on there, you know, what number? And again, it's going to relate more to data for the task force. But since the task force is kind of reporting into us, I think it's kind of important for all of us to kind of keep keep apprised of where we are on that too. So what is um, the number? I'm just so the the April twenty seventh number was two hundred and forty four, right? But then we had a number of others that they were holding and pending. Um, review and approval. So, so it's a big deal. We're still trying. And now we know what a dwelling is. So that was good today. That helped. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And you're still that conversation. It's part of part of the task force also of trying to go back and, you know, even like the public, you know, the maps and stuff have been um, produced. They're online. They're part of our packets you know, that show, you know, where those 244 are located. You know, I've had individuals who have said, well, I know that this person, you know, rents. And I was like, well, just you know, provide us that information because we want to kind of accumulate that during the task force also to try to determine, you know, do we need to have, you know, somebody you know, kind of doing a more of a scouring to, to determine, but that's, that falls into Commissioner and Chairperson Anderson's mm -hmm. decision. Yeah, no, amen. Yeah. Um, so then I will move to the last item or next to the last item, the public comments. Um, this can be on anything. Uh, doesn't have to be related to the agenda. It can be anything that they would like to address. If they want to do so, if you're in the room, you can just come up to the microphone. If you're online, raise your hand and introduce yourself, your name, address, and then limit any comments you may have for us to three minutes. In the room, do we have anyone who would like to address? We have one individual. Grace, 245 Spear. Um, 
So I'm not an architect, but I do know a lot about surveys and, and talking to people. So I really, so we can talk about anything, right? Yes, anything. So I love that you guys are moving in the realm of doing the listening campaign for the community. What I've noticed, um, maybe closer to the city stuff than I ever thought it would be, um, 80% of the people in this town don't know what's going on, but 100% are affected by it. So I think the listening campaign is very, very important. And I think you guys are also getting to an explainer campaign, I think is also incredibly important. I would just like to emphasize where you guys are going with the zones and the table and what is what, because when if I'm a layman, I talk to someone, I would actually say more than 80% don't actually know what's going on. And I really do appreciate all the work to get this, to get this going. You know, Mans, you've said a couple of times it's been kicked down the road. So I think it's great that this is being addressed. And I would also say for the planning commission, I think there is an opportunity to get unified standards across the board as far as measurements go, what parking is for what part of town, et cetera. How are things measured and then how are they enforced? I think there's a huge opportunity for you guys to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. My guess is we'll all agree. Anyone else online don't see any, so we will close final public comments and then answer any commissioner comments at this time. We'll go from this side if you would like to. I'm good. Here you go. No comments. A um, few things. Uh, one question is uh, 633 Butler Street. Um, that is um, that home has been uh, sold. It was sold last summer and they have an auxiliary dwelling unit. Yep. So I'd just like to confirm that um, the principal owner, I don't know if it's two rentals or not. I just I, I think that's something that needs to be looked at because it changed ownership. And I don't know if they're renting two of the, the if they're renting the ADU and the house separately or if they're renting it as one because the the. the the ordinance requires that if you are not the principal that you have to the yes house. correct yeah. yeah so i just and it may be completely compliant i just it, it's been brought up by, so by it, some neighbors at a greenhouse yes 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 i that my understanding i'll look back at my notes on that but i'm fairly certain i've talked with that new okay. property owner they're yeah, renting that under a single contract Okay, great. And then uh, Park Street, I, I mentioned I have to get the address for you. There's a couple of homes on Park Street, and, and um, Commissioner Broker may know about these. There's one house that is literally falling in on itself, yeah. which is a de essentially a derelict property. I'll, I'll get the address for you, but that definitely needs to be addressed because mm -hmm. this can become, a, it, it's already a public safety issue. Okay. Um, and my last question is, is the city subject to the zoning ordinance? And the reason I'm asking that question is, there are going to be proposals coming up for different projects in our parks and um, the parks are zoned. So I'm just curious, is the city subject to the zoning ordinance? I'll take that one, Chris. We've had this discussion. <laughs> um, part of this is probably a policy decision, but yeah, I, I think at this point, I'm probably going to say no comment. Um, I think I want to say that because we're actually, we're working on trying to establish exactly what the obligations are with respect to the city under the city code. So we'll have to report back on that. Okay. Very good. Good Thank question. you. Thank you. Good questions. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gardner. Anything for me? Mr. Lachey. Oh, good. Jeff. Let you people have been here all day get out. Exactly. <laughs> well, with that, I think it's it's been a positive meeting. It's been a positive uh, day, as always. I thank the zoning administrator and our staff, you know, here you know, they are putting in all the additional time to make all these things kind of come together. And we thank the members of the community for their consistent participation. And with that, I will ask for somebody to motion to adjourn. So moved. We have a second. Second. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.